Hi everyone, this is Naha Bailey from the American University in Cairo and I've got some folks here with me who are going to listen to Laura Gibbs tell us about how she uses tiny tails. Go ahead, Laura. Tell us who you are and what you do. Okay, thank you, Maha. I am um, an online teacher, online instructor at the University of Oklahoma. And I teach courses in folklore and mythology and the epics of ancient India. And I've used storytelling in my classes where students retell stories from the reading in class ever since I started teaching, you know, so students have written thousands and thousands of stories and they publish their stories at websites and that's all online if people are curious to look at it. But what I discovered just about a year ago is the power of, of tiny stories, stories that are hundred words or even less. And I've been writing myself just to, to experiment and learn about this, all kinds of tiny tales books. Here's one, tiny tales of a Nancy. And I've been putting those out as OER, as, as um, uh, textbooks, textbook materials that people could use. And of course, I was sharing that with my students to see what they thought about it over the past, um, this all started about a year ago. And the students were really excited about it, right? The students who were reluctant writers who found it hard sometimes to write the longer stories like 500 or 1,000 words that we were writing in class really jumped at this chance and were curious about it. And so this semester we did a book together and here's, you can see sort of similar cover. This is Tiny Tales of Fall 2020 and it's full of um, stories, short stories, tiny stories by my students. And you can find that online at anthology.lorgibbs.net. This is a, a printed version of the book, but they're free electronic versions of it, EPUB, Mobi, PDF, that kind of thing. And um, I was just amazed. About 50 students contributed the stories. There are over 100 stories there in the book. And they're really good. You know, I, this was a new experiment. I really didn't know what to expect. It's the pandemic. It's all just kind of weird. But when the students submitted their stories, there was such a range of stories. Some are 100 words. A lot of them are 100 words. But they also did shorter stories, two-sentence stories, six-word stories. And um, I was just excited to share the stories themselves, but also what they did to see if that's a process that would be useful to other people in their, uh, in their classes. This is a press book. And I use press books to create the electronic files and also the files used to create the Amazon paperback and the Amazon Kindle. If people haven't used press books, it's great. I'm a fan. So. And Laura, one of the things that I think, thinking about this as a, an opportunity for community building is, first of all, I think you talked about how students who maybe didn't like writing or didn't normally write so much, it gave them confidence to write it. And I'm also thinking that they probably read each other's more than they would have read, like if we asked them to read other stuff that's of different lengths, like just knowing that it's short and how quickly you can, like you can just gobble these up like snacks. I think when I open those books, I just keep reading like my nine-year-old reads uh, your tiny tales from India. Oh, and she loves them. Like we've been reading yeah. them for the past few days. I, I read them earlier, but she was reading them because they, they have a lot of um, they're all about animals and things like that, so they're a lot of fun for her. But also, they, they, they're short, so she can read and finish and read another one. Yep. And that's what I say at the beginning of each book, is they go really fast, which has the virtue of meaning that if, if there's a story that just doesn't click with you for whatever reason, well, you've lost 30 seconds of your life reading it. It's not a big deal. But when you find one that you do like, because it's short, it really kind of sticks with you because there's a... a a holistic way that you can kind of grasp this entire story. You see it right there on the page. It's a few paragraphs. It's, you know, maybe a little bit of dialogue, maybe a little bit of description, and it really can stay with you. And so this genre was really appealed to me because my academic background is I work on Aesop's fables and proverbs. And so I've always been interested in tiny stories like fables or things that are even smaller, like proverbs, which might just be two or three words, a proverb. And there's just something about the way, at least for me, that it really can, can grab you and stay with you. So it's partly this experience of snacking, like my friend Tenika calls them potato chip stories, you know, because you can just eat them one after another. But it's also a kind of focus and attention, which is really really positive, both for the reader, but also for the writer. Like when the students go to revise these stories, they can really revise them. Like when I ask them to revise their longer stories that are 
as long as a thousand words, that takes a long time. Just to read a thousand word story out loud is going to take you like 10 or 15 minutes. And you're tinkering as you go. And, you know, to revise a thousand word story is going to take you like an hour. And for students who aren't used to writing, an hour is a really long time to spend on something. But when you go to revise one of these little 100 word guys, you're chipping away. Can I get rid of three or four or five words here that I don't really need? Can I use some contractions? What can I do? And then I can add in a few more words and you choose them carefully differently. And it's not the same kind of stress of choosing a thousand words, right? When you write, every word is a choice. And there's like, millions of words you can choose from, right? So it's kind of a stressful choosing process, but choosing a hundred times to make your hundred word story is just less stress than choosing a thousand times, right? To write a long story. But still a really useful skill because like when we write, for example, an abstract, you have a limit to how mm -hmm. many words you can have in it. When you write a tweet, you have a limit to how right. many characters you have in it. And you learn to use shorter words to be more concise and to remove any fluff I think this is also a really important thing. Like one of the things that bothers me um, is when my students think that if they write more, then I will give them a better grade, but all they're writing is nothing. And when yeah. you limit it to a hundred words, then they're gonna have to really focus on what they have to say in those hundred words. And I think, I have a feeling and I'm hoping they will feel like it's less workload because it's a hundred words. Right. Even though it's actually a lot of critical thinking to make the hundred words count. What are you gonna say? Well, it's in its fun work. It's kind of like a game, or at least that's what it feels like for me. It's like, can I, can I, can I win the game? Can I manage to tell this story in a hundred words? Because a big part of what I'm doing, you mentioned abstracts, Maha, is I'm summarizing the contents of books, right? And before I used to just write out summaries of stories. And you know, that was useful for me, but it was pretty boring. I mean, no one really wanted to read summaries of stories, yeah. even though that's useful, right? Having digests of stories. But now it's like a summary, but cool. Like, what can I do so that this doesn't just sound like a summary, so that there's some really zing piece of dialogue or just something artful that I do, even just with the paragraphing, like getting students excited about paragraphing is, is a big deal because lots of times they'll write the hundred word story without any paragraph breaks. And one of the first revision suggestions I make is, well, go in and put in the paragraph breaks and see what that does. And it's like, wow, that's kind of what turns it into a story. When it's just one paragraph, it feels like an abstract or a summary. It doesn't even feel like a story. You put in those paragraph breaks and all of a sudden you've got a relationship with the reader, right? Because that's what paragraph breaks are. That's where you as the writer are saying, hey, reader, like stop for just a second and think about what's going on here. And you can really affect the meaning and the experience of the story with those paragraph breaks. But once again, it's a thousand words, you know, or a hundred words. A lot of the sentences are just one sentence or paragraphs are one sentence long. And that just makes you go, wow, I think it's cool. So, you know, there's one that I actually remember. It was one of the six word sentences, mm -hmm. uh, six word stories. And it was today was the same as yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember it. It's like a proverb almost. And yeah. I think what was, what's really good about it is it also made me think about as a parent, how do you, in this pandemic, if you're not able to go out, how do you make today not the same as yesterday? Because yeah. that sentence is saying something to me, right? Um, and how do you do it for students as a teacher as well to make life interesting for them? And to, yeah? yeah, so I mean, that was really powerful for me. And I think the six words, uh, I was thinking about those six word stories as also a way to help people think about titles for blog posts or titles for right. things they do instead of saying assignment one or whatever other boring things sometimes students come up with if they don't realize that that's, they have the permission to, to be creative. The hundred word stories, the title doesn't count against your word count either. And so that's a fun thing to think about too, is how you use the title, both to, to add something that you can squeeze into the story, but also how you frame it in a in a cool way because that's also something that's happening in the hundred word stories and sometimes the students would take because the the assignment i give them if they want to do this and this is all optional i hadn't built my classes around the microfiction, so it's just an extra credit thing they can do is i ask them to do two stories in a blog post one that's a hundred words and then another story that can be either another hundred word story 
or a two sentence or a Twitter length or six words. And a lot of them would use the six word story, not really to do a story, but more like the proverb ending, the moral of the story that goes with their hundred word story. And so I think that's where that quarantine six word story came from was that she had written a story about being in quarantine because she, she was, and then she wrote that six word item to go with the hundred word story, but she ended up liking the six word thing because it was so cool. And that's what she submitted for the book. And I'll just add that student is someone who did one of the coolest projects for the whole semester too, because not very many of my students wanted to tackle COVID related stuff for their class project and to work on it all semester. Cause you know, that's heavy, right? Working on that. But she did this amazing project about this woman who was a nurse in a hospital coming home from her COVID patients. And these goddesses of India started appearing to her with messages of hope rising up out of this diary that one of her patients who died had given her, who was a patient from India. Mm. And it's actually based on stuff that's been happening in India where people have been looking at traditional goddesses and thinking about who could kick the butt of the Corona Asura. They've been calling it the Corona demon and these goddesses are Asura slayers. And so she had done this amazing elaborate big project where every story she was pushing right up at the thousand word limit. But then she also came up with this great teeny tiny, the smallest possible story to go in this book. So that was exciting for me too, to see a student who thrived at writing long stuff to also thrive at writing this really tiny stuff too. Laura, I just love this work so much. And I just want to say that I think it's sort of echoing a bit of what was covered already, but important to draw out that when a writer um, is presented with certain constraints, Mm -hmm. there's a way in which the sharp focus of the craft of writing becomes, like you said, a game, something to play with and something to, um, you know, find energy towards. Um, The other thing is that that revision lens that's so difficult with students, when you revise writing, they see it as just clean it up for the teacher or just clean it up for the professor, um, put the period and the, the, the punctuation in the right places. They don't understand revision as a thinking process, which is really writing. Mm -hmm. revisioning is writing itself it's like a way of thinking right um so these this exercise of small like small stories or micro fiction that have really particular constraints is like almost like a gateway into experiencing the joy of writing you know Mm -hmm. the joy of being a writer so i love this um whole entire you know world that you've created with your students and i'm thinking for the spring I would like, I'm shaping a course that has to do with technology and futures and imagining futures. And I might even, I'm not sure yet. I'm still in the imagining stage myself in terms of the design of the course, but I'm thinking my latest thought is that it might be about the uh, the concept of the post-pandemic university, but I'm going to use um, in incremental steps, and I'd actually like you to weigh in on it, incremental steps, micro fiction, Um, engagements to lead us towards thinking about what the world could be, what education could be and the world could be after this moment. And as I was listening to you earlier, I was thinking, I mean, I mean, before I was listening to you, I was thinking that maybe it was almost like a just a numerical kind of under or chronological understanding kind of like we start with the smallest the six word story and then grow it out to something you know a constraint like the 100 word story or something like that but now i'm actually thinking it would probably better to go like this rather than this in the context of being able to understand what is meaningful and refining it a little bit, but at any you rate, mean start big and then go small. Yeah, not too big. Is it with your hands? So. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, like so, micro fiction, but in the sort of uh, one hundred, let's say one hundred word story sense, mm-hmm. and then sort of bringing it down to tighter and tighter. Um, after hearing you this morning, um, that's what I was thinking. 
Um, but at any rate, I just, I just welcome anybody's thoughts on how, if I was to sort of set up the series of microfiction exercises to speculate on what the world could be post pandemic, in which ways would you structure a series of microfiction um, engagements or act activities, et cetera? That's my thought right now. I mean, the, the approach I've been taking is to just let the students choose. Like I've got an activity and I'll, well, I can share all the links through, uh, through Maha where they um, look at a bunch of different examples. So some hundred word love stories from the New York Times, um, uh, six word stories from like the race card project, which is really fascinating, hint fiction. There was this great NPR piece on hint fiction. Um, uh, I need to add in something I've just discovered thanks to a friend at University of Oklahoma called VSS 365, very short stories every day at Twitter. So people use that hashtag VSS 365 at Twitter. And it was interesting for me to see that different students clicked with the different forms. Like this was not about writing. It was just exploring the different forms and saying what they think about it. Oh, post secret, which is an image based um, project. I haven't been working with images because images are so hard to publish in a book, but Post Secret is amazing. So for students who really want to work with that conjunction of images and text, that's really cool. Just a few words plus an image to go with it. So there's so many different options. Think more in about Post Secret because I think that's really interesting. Oh, uh, d do people know about Post Secret? It's been running for years. I don't even know how many years where people do these uh, usually confessional type postcards where they will create a work of art that's, you know, on a postcard. And sometimes it's just a single image, but often it's a collage or some kind of expressionist non-representational art that will have a few words on it. And sometimes it is just absolutely gutting. I mean, about these terrible life experiences they've had or feelings that they've really repressed and they send them in and I can't read Autumn, it's, you're, you're a post-secret person. I can tell from what, what is the name of the guy who runs that? And I can't remember his name. Can't remember. He, he does tour uh, and they do traveling shows of exhibits of these post-secret postcards. He's come to my university and he talks a lot to college aged audiences. So if people haven't checked that out, Frank it is Warren. something amazing. Sorry. Frank Warren. There we go. Yep. Apparently is his name. Yeah. So, and there's an active uh, post-secret Twitter account. And um, I remember first discovering those years ago. And so it's interesting for me looking back on that because I really, I appreciated it and I shared it with my students and some of my students had done post-secret inspired projects for class. Um, but I hadn't really seen it as part of this micro fiction ecosystem the way I do now. And Laura, I know back in the day, it was a physical address that you would like create a physical postcard and you would mail your postcard to him and he would digitize it and put it on the website. Is that still the way it works? Is, that's still part of it. And I don't know if they have an all digital path now, but yeah, there are still physical cards that travel as a physical show. And he's written, I think, at least one book. Um, yeah, I love that. He, the thing that I'm thinking of also is um, the anonymity of that and mm -hmm. taking the digital path, if they have done a digital path with so much tracking and so much going on in the digital world now, right? To maintain that secret part of it, for it to right. be a physical object that you put into the mail, there's like, especially because they're confessional, right? So for you to kind of have the trust to be able to say this thing that you need to say, um, for it to be this physical thing. It's just, there's so many layers to it. It's a, it's a really cool project. And to have the analog artifact too, just as you're saying, Autumn, I think it's profound, yeah. And something that, that I should mention really that was important, I think, about doing this book with my students was a lot of them just submitted their stuff anonymously or they just did it with their initials, which I thought was really cool because initials are a great form of kind of quasi anonymity where nobody knows who SK is, but they can give the book to their family or friends and say, that's my story. And of course, the person who knows who's got like the, the, the secret decoder for the initials and knows SK is my daughter, my granddaughter, whatever, 
Um, that was great. And I haven't gone through and toted it up, but I, I want to say about half of the students really wanted to publish under their names and were really excited that they were going to have something with their name on it. And others wanted to do just initials or um, anonymous. I would say it was about half and half. That's just a guess. And it surprised me too. It was interesting just for me since I get to know them over the course of the semester to see who wanted to put their name on it, was really excited about it, and who was more hesitant to do that for whatever reason. Sometimes I could guess, and sometimes I was kind of surprised, you know, who picked which option. But I think that made a big difference to them. And that's the, the same thing with the stuff they publish online, that they can do that with their name or anonymously or, or with initials. And um, I always like to talk about that with teachers because there's this sense somehow that that putting something online is full disclosure. And it's it's full disclosure of what you put online of the stuff, but there are all kinds of ways to represent or not represent your identity, your personal identity online. And that goes also for a, a book that's published. Silence, I can Does anyone talking. know, I was, I was asking people in the chat if they wanted to comment before I show you guys an improv way of getting students yeah. used to the idea of six wordish stories types of things. Um, does anyone want to comment before I do that? Um, I just want, wanted to say something really quick um, because thank you for the idea here. Um, I teach something, I teach instructional design. And so it's much, I guess, less creative in some aspects or more creative, differently creative, I suppose. <laughs> Let's go with differently creative. Um, but the hundred word story really has me thinking because like, we do digital storytelling as a way to teach right, from a teaching perspective. And I could totally see um, having my students maybe even starting their introduction or their first week's post, right, instead of a boring, you know, this is who I am, this is where I live, this is what I do bio, right, is like, tell me a hundred word story about you mm -hmm. um, as a way to just open that door um, and I love the idea of like the constraint of the hundred words really does help, um, help with the creativity as well. Cause then people are like, okay, let's start with the vision. What do we want to get? What, what are the, you know, so even the instructional design process, right. Start with the end in mind and like all that kind of stuff goes through the same process, um, in doing it. So I think that, yeah, it's just fascinating. That actually gives me an idea, Rebecca, because I, I've been trying to weave in the hundred words more and more into the class. And now I'm thinking a little hundred word thing to go with a favorite places post that I do might be really useful because the first post that students do in their blogs for my classes is to pick a picture of a favorite place. And sometimes they write something about it and sometimes they don't. And I don't want to like pressure people about the writing, but I'm thinking if I, I, just mention the possibility of doing a little 100 word commentary on the picture of the favorite place that they um, publish that that might just start to raise some interest, you know, and an important thing about this for me too has been that it's optional. You know, I don't want to force people to do it. And it's more just getting the students who are interested to do it. And there are always some, and then to put their stuff out there and then that builds more interest by the other students. Like um, the fact that these are so short means it's really easy to like stick them in the daily announcements or something. So I do daily announcements as a blog post to share with my students. And it's so easy to say, you know, so-and-so did a hundred word story or a six word story or two sentence story or whatever, and just put it right there in the announcements. And then that just inspires, makes other students think I could do that too, so. Can I ask you, Laura, about, about the review process? You talked a little bit before. Mm -hmm. So do students review their own stories or do they review each other's or do you review them? They, they do read each other's stories and leave comments. Okay. And the enthusiasm that they have for other people's hundred word stories is really great to see. I mean, that's good for the writer. And then, like I said, that inspires them to give this format a try themselves. But the great thing about the, the revision process is for the longer stories, it's just like what Mia was saying. They look to me to be kind of the leader, the editor, helping them to revise their longer stories. And they wait on my comments back before they really embark on revision. But with the hundred word stories in the actual review process, I've got a like seven or eight step thing you can do yourself to review 
revise and review your your hundred word stories and they've really embraced that process and feel confident about it like i don't think they feel really confident about revising a longer piece of writing they're just kind of stuck but there are things they can do processes actual like habits and practices for revision of those hundred word stories so that they can do that revision process on their own without waiting for me and that's been great because i um I don't ever want students to feel like they need me to revise or that they have to wait or be held back. So that was a big plus. I hadn't really expected that with the hundred word stories because I just hadn't anticipated what it would do. But giving them something they can do all on their own, I think is important for them. And it's also important for me because the next semester is my last semester of teaching. I'm going to retire from my university job, but I do want to keep on teaching and sharing and promoting these ideas about writing and stories. And I love that there's this mode now where you don't need a teacher. You really can use techniques and, and strategies so that you can take charge of your own writing and feel confident that you can improve your own writing on your own. I mean, it's great to have feedback from people, but lots of times you're writing on your own and you might get stuck. And it's a lot easier to get unstuck with a hundred word piece, I think. I think this could be so good for language learning and language teaching as well. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, get them going to write a good hundred word thing before you ask them to do something big, but make the hundred word thing substantial, right? Yeah. Uh, and meaningful to them. Uh, some Maha of the had best. A good idea that, go ahead. Well, I was going to say some of the best stories in the, the class book we did are from English language learners who really struggle in class. But they put in that time, you know, I mean, they're putting in all this effort and focus and that really paid off in their 100 word story. So they were, I think, especially proud to get to contribute to the book because they started out the class feeling, I think, kind of intimidated by doing creative writing in a foreign language. Because it does. I mean, for those of you who are bilingual, it is intimidating. I know I feel intimidated when I try to do it, but it's exciting. And when it works, you can feel really proud. So. Yeah. And Maha had a really good idea in the chat. Uh, you want to say it out loud? Hey, yeah. So, so back to Rebecca's idea about the 100 word introductions. I was thinking uh, that's a good idea. Introduction, uh, what they you know what they think or expect from the course, and then in, at the end you can do kind of like a closing the loop. So another hundred story, a uh, hundred word story. I think I think I want to do that too, if it's okay with you. I, I love the idea. <laughs> that sounds great. And and again, like it's it's kind of like how, how would you summarize like a book? How do you summarize a course or your learning in a semester in a hundred words? That'll be so good because they'll like they'll really choose what really matters, and I think that's mm -hmm. going to make a huge huge difference. I remember I once read a book, uh, and I said the summary of the book is cell phones are bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the book was about. Cell phones are bad. Okay, that's yeah. yeah can you imagine? Weeks. Can you imagine who wrote that book? I can tell you later. But anyway, what I want to show you guys, since we're all together, I want to do some improv with you that's similar to Tiny Tales, with a hack that my daughter came up with yesterday. So the improv is that together right now we're going to tell a story of X number of words in each sentence. Now you could choose that number as six or whatever length from the beginning or just randomly ask someone to choose a number. Or you could do what my daughter said and just pick a card and whatever the number on it, that's how long your sentence has to be. And so we're gonna do that together. You could even do a seven word story or we can just build a story on each other. And I've tried this building on each other's. It's really good for practicing listening um, and thinking on your feet to do the next one, but also giving students a chance to say pass if, if they're really not ready to respond and then you can come back to them. Is everyone willing to participate in this one? You want to try it? Shall we sure. do the post-pandemic? Shall we yeah. do the post-pandemic uh, university idea for Mia? Ooh. I love that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do you all want to do the same length, or do you want to have different, like a surprise every time? Well, I love the number that you originally pulled up was a seven, and there are yeah. seven of us. Oh, perfect. So, <laughs> okay. Seven times seven. All right. Okay. All right, so shall I just make up an order and put it in the chat so you know when you're coming up next? Think for a minute since you all know it's going to be seven words, but you still need to like build on the person before you. 
Fran, are you like panicking or just thinking? <laughs> are, are we, are we, so we, are we each doing seven words or are we each You're doing building one? on each other's. So it's seven like everybody words. has one word and we're just adding. And everybody word. has seven words. So That's doing what I yeah. yeah, so each of you is so, doing a seven word sentence, building yep. towards the same story. Ah, okay. I need yep. to go get a piece of paper because I think, that helps. Sure. yeah, sure. I'm going to be So back usually they, we say like count them on your fingers, but of course, yeah, get a piece of paper. Okay, I'll give everybody seven. a minute okay. to do whatever they need to do to get ready so that it's not too shocking. Okay. Smile. Yeah. It's gonna be no, it's We're fine. fine. I, think I definitely okay. need something to write. All right. <laughs> okay, I'll put the also order in. Yeah, I, I was going to say, Maha, when you were talking about this in the chat yesterday, I love the idea of using the suits of the cards for the genre, too. Like yeah. that, you, and that was yeah, so, so cool. This is my daughter also came up with this. And we were actually like, if you if you get um, a king or a queen or a jack, it's not a number. But anyway, all the cards have a suit. So if it's a heart, it has to be romantic. If it's a... Uh, Okay, guys. So we don't think that I'm that I'm. Uh, I need I need to get this call so we don't think okay. I'm running away from the task. Okay, okay. no worries. <laughs> Come back when you can. Um, and then I think clubs because it looks like a tree. It has to be something in nature. So and, cool. Yeah, and I think it was the spades was like it has to have an evil love story oh, with an evil okay. person. And the diamonds, and it has diamond? to be about money or treasure. Or oh, tools. okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But with improv, actually, they usually choose the genre as well. And sometimes they ask each person to do a different genre, which is very funny, too. Wow. But oh, that's today, so let's cool. just pick the, Let's just not overcomplicate it. Let's just do okay. the seven words, each one of us building on each other. I, so I've done this kind of thing. It's going to be a 49, 49 word story, basically. Yes. Which okay. is very cool. Yes, it right? is. So let me do it in order and let's leave Maha to the end. If she can make it, then she makes it. Okay. If she can't, that's fine. All right, I'm um, going to get my paper. Okay, go ahead. Now I want to do it with a tarot deck, Laura. Yes, I was thinking that you and Maha mentioned that in the thing. There's that beautiful Italo Calvino novel, The Castle of Cross Destinies, about the tarot deck and storytelling. Oh, Autumn, do you not know that book? <gasps> Oh, you have to, you'll love it. What is it again? Tell me, oh. I'm going to write it down. It's called The Castle of Cross Destinies, and it's by Italo Calvino, and it's about these characters who end up in a sort of mysterious place, and they're telling stories with tarot cards. Ooh. So that is why Autumn would especially like it. So Speaking of that, my daughter and I actually also do this thing with cards, where you just pick four random cards, and you make up a story based on whatever cards you get. Mm. I, I mean, I and guess that we're copying me. what people do with the fortune telling, but we're just playing around with it. I mean, that's basically what they do, but I don't know how they, I don't know the, I don't know the process. I'm not interested. That also in reminds me of the, um, it also reminds me of the story cubes. Have story cubes. Story yeah. cubes. Uh -huh. They're dice. Are they and like they you dice little, and then things they come up? Little symbols on them. Yeah. Instead of like dots, right? And they're uh -huh. weird, like little symbols too, like a beach ball or like a, <laughs> a I don't know, a key in a keyhole, like like little things like that. And so you roll mm -hmm. the dice and whatever you get, they're they're they've got a bunch of different ways that you can you make put the story together. Them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. All right. Are you guys do you feel kind of ready? You can take your time with each one. It's not like of course some people it just takes them a little bit longer to make sure they get the seven words and all that. So I, I thought I'd start with Laura and then Mia. Since Laura's been doing this for a while, she'll be faster than everyone else. And since it's Mia's post-pandemic theme, it might come a bit faster oh, for her. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know. I don't know. This but is also I'm, something yeah, we I can think, do, we can do something like this on Slack. Oh, whatever you like. We can just, like, if you if you want to do this asynchronously or synchronously, but just with chat, you can just do it on a, like a Slack team oh. or something. You don't have to do it during a Zoom session. That's true. Um, so is is me are Mia and Laura switching order? Well, I'm trying to come up with something here. I'm almost at seven, but it's too many. Hang on. I have um, one that will fit in any almost there. On the last oh, one. <laughs> should we be? I thought we were waiting. Should we be writing right now, or should we wait until we hear what the you, person I before mean, us? I would normally build. Okay. I would build on the one before me. But if you have something mm -hmm. in mind, you could get I, sort of. I can. Start I typing. can start. Should I start typing in the chat? Or say it out loud, whichever. Okay. Let's um, say it out loud because the recording is not going to show the chat. 
Okay. So let me make sure. Campus squirrels rejoiced when people came back. And I'll type it in the chat too. Oh, I did already. Oh. Because I do that for my students so that they can focus on listening. But very yeah. cool. I'll keep doing that. Mia, you're up next. Yeah. So now I have to think. I'm sorry I'm not a quick person. So just give me two seconds. I mean two no, minutes. It's okay. okay. Maha, you just missed one sentence and it's written in the chat. So that's also useful because if someone disappears campus unless you're testing their joys when skills. people came back. Yeah. Unless you're testing their listening skills, it's, I think it's useful to type it in the chat. And then at the end, you've got the 49 words story, right? We can give this one to Anne Marie if she does the, the COVID tales. <laughs> yes. So we're doing seven word sentences, but building on each other's stories, Maha. This is so cool, Maha. <laughs> I think it's nice practice also for students to realize actually if you can come up with it in a couple minutes, then if I give you more time, you can come up with a really good one, right? Like this, these ones can be funny, like because you're just trying to catch up and get going with it. So do I build on the sentence? Uh, yeah, that's but the you're, chat? yeah, but you're before last, so don't worry. It's not your okay. turn yet. It's okay, I, I think I have it. You ready? Okay. So I'll start with mm -hmm. Laura's. Campus squirrels rejoiced when people came back. Snacks aplenty, but they seemed so different. All right, who's up next? Rebecca, you're up next. <laughs> okay. International friends compare wildlife and food over Zoom. <laughs> Fran, is it your turn? I'm back on, I'm back on Laura's. Classes moved out to join the squirrels. <laughs> Hey, Autumn. Maha, you're after Autumn. <laughs> no, I'm getting nervous because I'm like, I have nothing in my head. It's like, no, call me again. Call me, please. It's okay, it's okay, man. Autumn, are you I don't know yet. I'm still writing. They know how our students feel, I'm right? right? It's very <laughs> funny because right. my students, so my students never have their cameras on, so I couldn't see the panic on their faces. But they didn't panic. Right. They they went with it. They were so cool with it. But it was it was. Um, I think in in my class when we did this, they made up a new revolution. <laughs> It was very funny. <laughs> like they, they made up this really highly political thing. Like I couldn't share it afterwards. It was so political. <laughs> well, the squirrels are a very big deal on my campus. So I think my students would run with the, the squirrels. squirrels. I love squirrels. We and have that too. And we all, have geese but in this too case, that are everywhere. <laughs> I'll you share a uh, raccoon, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, and we have I, we have an outside pet too. I feel bad for the writers because sometimes they need silence to think. So I don't want to. But yes, we have an outside pet, a, a pet who's a raccoon that visits us every night, and oh. he takes an apple, and I give him an apple or a piece of bread every night, and he's like, "I'm gonna I'm gonna send you guys a picture of it." Like that's, that's great. Adorable. It's adorable. <laughs> Well, someone runs a Twitter account for the OU Elder Squirrel, so I'll I'll share that link with Maha. It's really fun. Our campus squirrels Twitter account. So I, I wanna I wanna like uh, t tell you about something that I was just discussing with a colleague of mine. Hopefully, this will distract you from the. <laughs> From the sentence you'll forget but actually we're writing a book chapter and the editors are really focused on writing a more reflective piece so they wanted us to talk about us and our experience 
and relate that to the findings. And we are struggling because, and we, and, and for me personally, I realized it's the, because we've been trained to be objective and to detach ourselves yeah. from, from this. And so this, I'm struggling right now, but I'm not surprised because I guess the PhD just kind of trains you to kind of just don't feel about anything, pull yourself, uh, you know, detach yourself from things. And it's, it's killing the creativity. I remember, you know, uh, at one point in my life, I was more creative than this. Uh, it's just amazing, you know, uh, and we were just talking about that. I love what you're saying. I think it's such a brave thing to say, you know, in, in this context too, of pedagogy and et cetera, because, I would confess that I think much of my post tenured professional life is been about, that's, I mean, for those outside of the US context, that means post um, securing, um, you know, uh, having a secure scenario. Much of it has been unlearning that impulse and finding back, like reclaiming the joy of creativity in, in both the teaching and the writing. Um, and writing with people, like collaborative writing, because not just f creative, but scholarly writing creatively. Because the PhD is like writing on your own for years and years. Yes. Which is not good for the rest of your life to do that, I think, yes. for most disciplines. And, and not, ju not just that, there is, a, there is a negative connotation to you speaking about yourself like it's not just something that okay it's better to be objective and detached no it's bad to it's not know. scholarly it's not yeah a, this this is bad scholarship yeah. exactly yeah and i were just talking about this like a couple of days ago and i told her as yeah. soon as i finished my phd i rebelled against mm -hmm. ever writing that way again because i remember how my supervisor used to say that i changed my um because i read a lot of fiction and so my writing style was kind of like that and he kept saying, this, this sounds nice, but you can't do that for your PhD. And so as soon as I finished, I'm like, I'm never writing that way again. For some reason, it was easier for me to, to resist maybe because I didn't live there. But you know, Maha, like thinking about our parts of the world and how our, the schooling in our parts of the world doesn't even give students that creativity when they're kids. So they would never develop it if we didn't do it in our courses. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not like in the US and, and, and Europe where there's that measure of creativity for very young children and then they stop doing it. No, in ours, like they never get exposed to it. So getting students to do something like just these seven word stories and in, in improv is in itself like a big step and a big thing for them. Autumn, are you ready? Wow. Or did we distract you so much? Okay. No, I'm ready. I've been ready for a minute now. <laughs> but you all were going, so I didn't want to interrupt you. I can't wait for it this sentence. It felt so heartfelt. Okay. It's like so personal. <laughs> well, I went a little <laughs> whimsical and a little bit fictional. So maybe I'm not a good researcher. I don't know. My next no, edition no, is no. Squirrels Joined the Classes. They Learned So Much. <laughs> yes. It was worth the wait. <laughs> It was <laughs> worth the wait. <laughs> All right, Maha, do you need time to think about what happens after the squirrel joined the classes? I, I need to count the words. I have something yeah. in mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna put much twice. So it, it's seven. Okay, seven words. <laughs> Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, I love it. <laughs> you oh, I love learn it. much, much more. I love it, Maha. Thank All you. right. And mine, I cheated because I was the last person. So I was sort of predicting what I might say at the end, and it actually ends up that it works. I was going to say, classes will never be the same again. I love it. <laughs> it's perfect. Had a lot of practice. <laughs> Let's read it from the beginning to the end. Yeah. Go campus ahead, squirrels. Campus squirrels rejoiced when people came back. Snacks aplenty, but they seem so different. International friends compare wildlife and food over Zoom. Classes moved out to join the squirrels. Squirrels join the classes, they learn much more, and the humans learn much, much more. 
glasses will never be the same again. <laughs> love it. Love it. Uh, that's I love great. It. Well, I will share that at Twitter with our campus elder squirrel. I'm sure he will. <laughs> <laughs> so you can download the chat from here and maybe we'll, uh, we'll include it in some other thing. There might be something to it in that like nature sort of knows something that humans really need to remember kind of thing <laughs> and teach us, right? <laughs> well, I'll just say squirrels do not zoom, right? So. Well, see, you could, right? you could also changed the um, wildlife to squirrels. So international friends compare squirrels. Ah, and, that, and you know, squirrels yeah. and snacks, right? Squirrels uh -huh. and snacks. Ooh, I like that. And, and that, you, that would be the revision. That would be the yeah. revision. Exactly. Like, that now revision. that you have the yes. full story, how would you change it? Yeah. I mean, I guess another way of doing it is to give everyone time to write their own seven word sentence. Like to give, give everyone five minutes. And then when we put them together, we rethink what how to make them fit together that, that might be a better way so that everyone has time to think and there isn't that time pressure mm -hmm. uh, but that then after we put it together of, we revise sorry Anu? it that also gives everyone a uh, exquisite corpse yeah, yeah. i mm -hmm. don't know what that is i was just saying it, um, it gives everyone an equitable experience um doing it having everyone just write it down and then say it because then you're not privileging people that go first or last or mm. where they're less comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm going to try because I've never done anything like this as collaborative story writing together to set up maybe a Google Doc with some story threads for people just to follow on and build on and put in a little randomizer or something for the number of words just to add that game feeling because I love that having the number of words be a random thing. Autumn, I'm remembering now that one of what the exquisite corpse is. Before. Oh yeah, please do. Yeah. Sure. Um, exquisite corpse is a. This kind of fits into my uh, surrealist. It's yeah. a surrealist like kind of parlor game type of thing that you'd play, and that you can actually do it with words, but you can also do it with images. So you can do it with a drawing. You fold. Paper. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you fold paper, and the whole idea is that you hide a portion just a portion and you let a tiny little bit show of the last thing that the last person did um so if it's writing it might be like the last sentence or even just the last word or two and then that the next person gets the last word or two or the last sentence to build on but that's all they get and um so that would be an interesting way to do it too to go around the room and have everyone be silent so you don't say your full um your full seven word story you just give the last mm -hmm. word and the next person has to use the last word in you know and then you kind of make them all flow together sure uh adam i think this also can there's another lesson in this is that what kind of assumptions do we have so you have a story but they don't know the whole story they know just the last sentence or the last word yeah. and so i think i think that's a very uh very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. it really I'm is. Steal that one too. <laughs> <laughs> one of my students made a connection that I hadn't thought of, but when she was saying what the microfiction, the really short ones reminded her of was that blackout poetry. Have people ever done that? That's a really cool yeah. thing where you take the text and you you black out a lot of the words so that you just leave a bit of poetry or a story that you sort of surface out of that. And that's something you can do to academic writing, which is really cool. So if academic writing is full of all kinds of like, you know, verbiage and kind of flat and kind of impersonal, you can do this blackout poetry trick on an academic article. And all of a sudden it's saying something that it wasn't that's saying right. before. And there's yeah. a, um, a really cool tool that someone wrote to help students do blackout poetry using Google Docs, telling them how to set up the background color and the text color and everything to make it easy to make blackout poetry in a Google Doc. So that's something I need to share too. And it really do does that have in that in same. Our, Laura. Um, oh, cool. That, that would be perfect for you. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's really amazing what the students do. And sometimes they get really creative, like just in terms of the like presentation as well. Like, um, you know, they couldn't even just take a picture of an old text, then draw on it and then take another picture. And they, they've done some really amazing things. The other thing is the cutout poetry. So you yep. 
um, cut every single word out of like some tract or some academic piece or something. And then you literally like put it in a grab bag and then people put, put their new, like, yeah. Anyway, it's, it's fun stuff. And it, and it also is a way to sort of reach emerging writers and bring in that creativity. Um, and that aspect of physically cutting something. Yes, exactly. It. It was so yep. cool. Yep. And it's a really ancient tradition. There's this thing called the cento, which is where people in the Middle Ages would take classical Latin poetry that was all pagan and take the words apart and rearrange them so it would tell a Christian story instead of a pagan one. So people have been doing this kind of stuff without the convenient technology that we have for like over a thousand years. So. I love all these ideas. It's wonderful. Okay, I think we're gonna have a lot to write to let, to guide people through this video because there are so many different things we talked about. But hopefully, we'll have enough resources um, from Laura and from all the different things that we came up with, like the post secret and the, all the other ones, um, so that folks can choose whichever one of these uh, works best for them. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you all of you. I'm just gonna stop the recording, but don't leave yet unless you have to. <laughs>